Kia ora. In this video, we're going to talk about how to calculate displacement from velocity time graphs. This is like another thing to add to our collection of calculations we can do using graphs. So just to summarize what we can already do, um, so far we've learned about how to calculate velocities from position time graphs. So that's these two cases here, where I've got a position time graph, so I look at x and t. And I can calculate, calculate an average velocity by basically taking two points on my graph and working out the rise divided by the run. Um, that gives me the average velocity over that interval. Or I can calculate an instantaneous velocity, which is at this particular point in time down here, we draw a tangent line and calculate rise over run for that. And exactly the same calculations when I have a velocity time graph instead, so I've got velocity in time, those calculations give me an average acceleration or an instantaneous acceleration. So at the moment we can get velocity from position graphs and we can get acceleration from velocity graphs. But what if we want to go the other way? So what we're going to look at in this video is how to go from a velocity time graph and work out information about displacements by going backwards. Here's a velocity time graph. We'll start off with a simple one because with a velocity that's just constant. So we know that over this particular interval of time, the velocity is three meters a second. And what that also means is the average velocity is three meters a second because it doesn't change. Hopefully that sort of is comfortable enough thought. So, I mean, we're asked to find the displacement between one and four seconds. So there's one there and four. Not, not necessarily the whole motion. Okay, so what we do is we go, all right, well, things we know, we know that the average velocity is equal to three meters per second in that interval. And what else do we know? It's just trying to sort of piece together some things that we actually understand already. We know there's a formula for average velocity, so maybe we can do something with that. So the formula for average velocity is that the average velocity is delta x divided by delta t. And we know that delta t, in this particular case, is 3. It's just 4 minus 1. So that's interesting. We know delta t. We know average velocity, so we should be able to find what delta x is. So if I rearrange this equation by multiplying both sides of it by delta t, then I get delta x is equal to v average times delta t. So that is equal to 3 times, my delta t was also 3 as it happens, and so my displacement is equal to 9 meters. Okay, so that's kind of cool. We can find the displacement when we have a flat velocity graph. Great. Um, but before we move on, we're actually going to think about what interpretation geometrically this thing we just calculated actually has. Because we multiplied two numbers together, a 3 and a 3. Um, that gave us 9. Cool. Uh, what does that mean on our picture? Well, if we look at our picture, we basically multiplied this distance along here by this distance up here, that's the, that's the delta t, 3 is across the bottom, and the delta uh, v, sorry, the average velocity, 3, is kind of the height here. So what we've really calculated is actually a rectangle. Um, so the area of this rectangle just here, so let's just color that in. So that velocity of, uh, sorry, that displacement of 9 meters can be thought of as this area underneath uh, graph. Okay, but sure, that kind of makes sense, but it only applies to the situation where we've got a straight line along here, and can we be more general? Well, let's look at a slightly more involved example where our velocity is changing. So now we've got an example where our graph is not flat, our velocity is going up um, from 2 up to 8, and let's try and find the displacement between 0 and 5 seconds somehow. Right, now, the only thing we know is on our previous slide, our calculation was the area of a rectangle, a height of the average velocity times the distance along the base. So it's that height there, distance along the base, multiply those together, gives us that nice area that we colored in green there. 
Um, so we can't, we don't have any rectangles here. So what we're going to do is we're going to, rather than calculate exactly the right answer, we're going to approximate our graph here by a slightly different one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that for the first second, instead of the velocity going up from 2 to 3, it just stays constant at 1. And then for the second second, I'm going to assume that the velocity stays constant at 3. For the third second, I'm going to assume it stays constant at 4. Between time equals 3 and 4, I'm going to assume it stays constant at 5. And you kind of see what's happening here. I'm saying, all right, I don't know how to do the orange line, but I can pretend it's flat between those just for one second intervals. This could give me something that behaves kind of similar. And the cool thing is I can actually work out the displacement for each one of these rectangles here. And remembering from our lesson on displacement, I can look work out the overall displacement by just adding the individual displacements up. So let's color these in as well. Basically we know that the area of this first block is going to give me my displacement during that first second. The area of that second block will give me the displacement during the second second. And so on. So I can work out all these individual displacements. Call this one delta x1, delta x2, 6. Those are going to be the individual displacements that happen in those seconds. So my overall displacement will be those added together. And we know that each one of those is just the area of the rectangle in question. So that is going to be 2. The base is going to be 1, the height is going to be 2, plus this next one is height 3. Let's just write them all in, plus. And the last one is plus 1 times. So that is going to be 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 4 is 9, plus 5 is 14 plus 6 is 20, plus 7 is 23 meters overall. For my approximate uh, velocity time graph, where I'm assuming the velocity stays constant each second and then jumps up when we get to the next second, you might be like, okay, cool, that's not 100% convincing, um, but I kind of believe you. If our velocity just was that graph, then fine, but actually our velocity is not a staircase, it is a straight line. But then if you imagine we do the same thing again, but instead of having the divisions we just did, imagine we divided it up much finer. So let's just do it in a different color. So imagine instead of doing that staircase, we did a staircase where we were going up twice as often. And we'd get a little bit more extra area this way um, because our rectangles get taller a bit faster. Or if we did it again again, um, and maybe we did it we jumped up every quarter of a second. And you can see that if you imagine we sort of take this process to having a really, really large number of very, very narrow rectangles, then what we're really calculating is just the area underneath this graph. Um, we don't have to do rectangles. We imagine the rectangles are getting really small and we're getting a lot of them. And so that area is, that's going to basically be the area underneath my graph. So I could basically go back to the drawing board and say, all right, that's nice. So what I can actually do is ca just calculate the area under the graph total. So let's do that now. So let's just rub out what we had before. That sort of gave us the idea. Um, but actually, all we actually want is just the area underneath the graph. So let's figure out how we'd work that one out. So when we've got an, an, a nice area like this, and the only examples we're going to do in this course will have nice sort of straight lines, um, we can work out the overall area by just working out a couple of easier shapes that we know how to do. So I know how to work out the area of this rectangle here. That's going to be part of the area. And I also know how to work out the area of this triangle here, which is also going to be the other part of the area. So I'll do those separately. Let's just color them in as well. And if I add those two areas up, that will give me the overall area that I'm after. So I'll call that area one and area two. And let's see how close it is to 23 meters once we figure it out. So area one. That's a triangle, so the area is equal to half times the base times the height. Base of my triangle is 6, so it's going to be 1 half times 6 times the height of my triangle is also 6. It goes from 2 up to 8. Notice the scale is a little bit different on the two axes. So that equals 18. And my other area 
is equal to, it's a rectangle, so it's just going to be the base times the height. The base of the rectangle is 6, as previously discussed. The height of the rectangle is 2, so that equals 12. So my actual displacement over that time interval is equal to 18 plus 12 meters, which is 30 meters. And we kind of expected it not to be the same as 23. We knew 23 was an underestimate because there was area that we hadn't accounted for. And so 30 kind of makes sense. That is the full area underneath that graph. So we can pretty much always find displacements from velocity time graphs just by working out the area between the two points in question. So this one it was between 0 and oh, 5. I went all the way to 6. So let's just change the question, shall we? Um, to make it fit our purposes, <laughs> in 6 seconds I went all the way there. So 23 in the first case and 30 in the second. Right, um, so here's another example. Let's do a quick example where we want to find the displacement from the starting position at two different points in time. So we want, first off, we want to find the displacement from the starting position at 2.5 seconds. So that is, 0.5 is just here, so it's going to be this area here. Um, I only want to go as far as that because um, any further and that's beyond what I care about. And displacement from starting position that means at t equals 0. So it's between t equals 0 and t equals 2.5 seconds. So my displacement is just the area and that's a triangle. So the area is a half times the base 2.5 times the height times 5 which is 6.25 meters. Now, here's where the, the last little caveat uh, comes in that we have to think about. My velocity after 2.5 seconds has become negative, which means I have turned around and I'm going back in the direction, uh, going back towards where I started. So that means my displacement from my starting point is actually now going to be going down. And the way we deal with this, with this graphical method, is now we're taking between 0 and 4 seconds now. So the way we deal with the issue of the displacement changing and getting smaller again is when we have any area that sits beneath the axis, we count it as negative rather than as positive. So we sometimes refer to this as the signed area when we are taking into account whether that area is underneath the axis or above it. So to work it out at, at time equals 4 seconds, we're going to use the, the concept of signed area. So my displacement will be the sum of those two areas, the blue one and the red one, but the red one is going to have a negative sign on it. So it's going to be equal to plus 6.25, because that's above the axis, and it's going to be minus the other piece. So it's a triangle, so it's going to be 1 half times 1.5, that's the base, height is 3, which is 2.25, so that equals 6.25 minus 2.25 which equals 4 meters. So when we're using this trick to find displacements from our velocity time graphs we just need to make sure we use the signed area. Pieces of area underneath the graph get counted as negative. So one more example, I'm not actually going to work it through but here's a slightly more complicated looking one. So how would I go about working out my displacement here? Let's say we wanted the, uh, the displacement between our start point um, at time equals zero and our whatever time that is by the end. So all we have to do is basically break our areas up into pieces that we're confident we can calculate. If you know complicated formulas for geometrical shapes that are other than triangles and rectangles, by all means use them. But what I'd probably look at doing for this particular one is I'd say, okay, this piece I'm going to make a triangle there, a triangle there, and a this bit can be a triangle and a rectangle. You may have you may know the formula for working out that piece in one hit. That's fine too. So what I might say is I'd call this area one. Let's say this is area two, area three, area four area 5 and area 6 and that's basically going to be five triangle calculations and a rectangle and so my overall displacement would just be the blue ones as positive and the red ones as negative so a1 minus a2 
minus a3 minus a4 minus a5 plus a6 and that will give me the displacement between my starting and finishing times. Um, in case you just need a quick reminder about how triangle areas work, one last thing to say, just remember when we've got a triangle, the area of a triangle is just, this is the base along here, let me go in red. Then occasionally people get a bit confused about what the height is. The height is this distance along here. And that's gonna work for any old triangle. So sort of imagine a little dashed line going over to here. My area is equal to one half times the base times the height. Cool, so now we've kind of completed a bit of the, the puzzle. Um, we now know that if we've got a velocity time graph, we can go backwards and calculate displacements from it. Um, and you can do the same thing from an acceleration time graph to go back to velocities, but we're probably less likely to be doing this very often. But in principle, it's the same thing, just because the same calculations we use to get from velocity to accelerations as we use to get from positions to velocities. Cool, I think that's plenty, so we'll see you next time. See you later.